Continuing production of the open mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and this is the second of two programs with Hendrik Hertzberg, senior editor at the New Yorker magazine, and the man who, along with other longer pieces, so often writes the editorial comments that make the magazine's front of the book talk of the town such an absolutely must-read delight. Now, with some help from my guest, I'll try to pick up where we left off last time. Uh, Rick, what, what in all of this talk that we've indulged in about the press and the power of the press and the power of the editorial we, et cetera, what does it lead to in terms of your own sense of what your sense of the nature of human nature, how your perspective about the nature of human nature has influenced or has informed the editorial content that you write. What, what lies beneath Rick Hertzberg's editorial commentary? Hmm. Well, that's a big and, and terrific question. Um, I think there's a, there's a set of, there's a, there's a fundamental set of, of values isn't quite the right term, but something, some combination of values and sensibility that my experiences uh, of a lifetime have bred into me and that I've come to trust. And these inform, uh, these inform what I write. And, and, uh, and I try, I'm very sensible of the responsibility that writing these, these little pieces entails. Uh, and and in, in a way, uh, tone, it's a matter of, of tone. Uh, tone is, even though it's nothing but words on paper, there's a sort of, uh, there's, a, there's, an, there's an emotional um, vibration that I can't really put into words, but that, if, that I hope affect the way I put words together. Uh, this is an, as abstract an answer, in a way, as, as your question was. What you well, know, sort a, of you asked for it? It's a hell of a question. I mean, I, I, I realize that. But you remember the old Edward R. Murrow, This I Believe series? Mm -hmm. that, that really is what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought I ought to pick up I, that well, Murrow. I, I believe that, that uh, I believe in, in democracy. Uh, I believe in. I mean, ruled by the people. Ruled by the people, but not for its own sake, uh, for the sake of liberty. I mean, I think the, the bedrock, my bedrock value is, is, is liberty. And democracy just happens to be th the best and indeed the only way that liberty can be guaranteed. If there was some other way to guarantee uh, liberty, I'd be happy to hear about it and, and go along with it. Uh, I don't know of any. And, and a kind of, of fairness. Uh, Equality is a word we don't hear much of uh, anymore, but I, be I believe in civic equality, and I believe that, that, that while the market is a, a wonderful mechanism for the ordering of economic activity and the distribution of goods, that, that uh, it is not a moral force. It's a, it's a, it, it has no morality, and that we have to organize our society in a way that mitigates the, the un inequalities of 
that the market creates. That's that that that's my basic. Um, those are my basic politics. It's interesting when you talk about the marketplace, because it seems to have become the singular moral principle or immoral principle that guides us today. Everywhere you turn, uh, liberals as well as conservatives, there is this talk about marketplace values. That's what destroyed the uh, Soviet dictatorship, uh, the triumph of our marketplace values. Uh, what's your own feeling about uh, I, that, that I, you were out of place? No, I don't believe that. I don't think that's what destroyed the, the Soviet Union. I think it was the triumph of these of these other values, of, of uh, democratic values, not not of market values. And I also... I meant our market values, that mean, we were so superior in power, in our uh, material power, that it destroyed the the Soviet Union. They couldn't keep up with us. No? I don't believe it. Um, I, I think I think that the, that the Soviet Union collapsed because it was so out of sync with with uh, human nature. It was an unnatural arrangement. And once the pall of fear was lifted from the Soviet Union by Gorbachev, the rest followed uh, more, or less, more or less automatically. And uh, power, American power and material superiority and prosperity uh, played a role, certainly American power played a role in containing the Soviet Union and in, and in preventing uh, a catastrophic war between East and West, but that's not what that's not what brought it down, and that's not what brought South Africa's repressive regime down, and that's not what brought Mexico's one-party state down. I mean, these these developments all over the world in the in the late 80s and early 90s uh, were it's a mistake to think of them as a triumph of simply of market capitalism. And we here in this country, I, I'm convinced that one of the reasons that we tend to think that way is that our political system, uh, for all the liberty that it gives us, is, doesn't work terribly well. It doesn't work as well as, the, as other dem democratic systems around the world. And so we have come to think of the public sector and a democracy as uh, inefficient and undependable and doesn't really work. Because it doesn't work, we have come to think of government as a villain. Mm. Government is the enemy, as we've heard yes. candidate after candidate say. Yes, and, and no one ever seems to notice that there's a, a glaring contradiction between our pride in our Constitution and our way of life and our democracy on the one hand and the idea that government is the problem and that politicians are all a bunch of, of selfish no-goods on the other. We hold these two ideas in our mind at the same time, and there, there, there's a, a real contradiction between them. Uh, I believe that it's because, I believe that, that our system needs reform, our political system needs reform, and that most of the other countries of the world in the last decade or so, most of the other advanced and semi-advanced countries of the world have undergone some fairly dramatic reform. Okay, you and put it on the table. What are the reforms? Well, I'd certainly like to see, uh, you know, this is, this is one of my l tiny crusades that, that I sneak into. Proportional those representation. Articles. Things like proportional representation, like uh, instant runoff voting, um, various ways to mitigate the undemocratic features of our 200-year-old uh, political arrangements. I mean, our political arrangements were established at, at the dawn of democratic technology, you might say. The framers did an incredibly good job working with what they had to work with, but they, work, they were working from essentially no basis in experience, purely from theory. They did a hell of a job considering where they started, but I think they would be the first to be appalled that we regard that we haven't fixed up their handiwork. Uh, I've read a, uh, there's a wonderful Library of America volume called The Debates on the Constitution, um, full of letters back and forth among the framers. And basically what they say is, 
well, this constitution that we've drawn up, you know, it's okay, it's not what any of us really wanted, but thank God we put in that part about how you can amend it. So in, in 10 years or 20 years, the mistakes, whatever mistakes we've made, they'll be fixed, so let's not worry about it too much. The framers really thought they were making it, I wouldn't say easy, but at least more possible than it has seemed to become. They certainly underestimated. Yeah, they certainly underestimated how difficult amendment would be. They made it essentially they made it as easy as they could while still making a deal with the slave states. I mean that most of much of what's wrong with our constitution is there because the interests of slavery had to be accommodated. And I don't mean just the three-fifths rule or uh, just the open parts that accommodated slavery, but the building in of ways in which determined minorities can thwart the will of a majority was largely done in the service of preserving slavery, because that was the only way to get a deal. That was the only way to get the Union together and organized in, a, in something like a functioning national government. And as we saw, that national government was unable to solve the country's most basic problems, uh, namely slavery. The Constitution essentially collapsed in 1860. And that's a part of the story that's always left out. You know, when we say, gosh darn it, this Constitution of ours has served us well for 200 years. Well, it didn't serve us well when it came to solving the biggest problem America had. And it also didn't serve us well in solving uh, the, the successor problem to that, the problem of racial segregation. I mean, it's, it's a tremendous failure of our Constitution that racial segregation, legalized racial segregation, had to be abolished by a court rather than by the workings of democratic political institutions. It's interesting, in Robert Caro's new third volume uh, of his massive, wonderful biography of Lyndon Johnson, he begins with a magnificent section on the Senate of the United States. And that's where you realize what you are saying was so true that the impact of what initially was a question of slavery then became a question of civil rights uh, and race relations tied up the Senate of the United States and with its being tied up through the filibuster tied up so much of what our potential as a country is. And this has continued in, in so many ways. Uh, to the, the great controversy over what, what went wrong with Clinton's health plan. Uh, and we've, we, we know all the standard explanations for why it failed. But the real explanation is that the, the Republicans, or a decisive part of the Republican Party, decided to stop it and that they would be willing to use the filibuster to stop it. That's what really happened. And that undemocratic feature of our Constitution has stymied us time and time again. And it's one of the reasons that, it's the main reason really, why we're different from Europe. Why we're, why we're different in terms of, of equality and welfare and taking care of people. Rick, what do you think the uh, consequ consequences will be not for the moment, but over time of that difference, of that problem? Well, uh, I hope that eventually the consequences will be that we'll move in a more democratic direction. Um, there's also uh, you know, the Europeans, every, the grass always looks greener on the other side of the fence. And, and when I talk to Europeans uh, and try to tell them uh, about the advantages of the way they govern themselves. They say, oh, but, you, but we, we love the way you have a voluntary sector and, and, uh, and the way your markets are so much more vigorous than ours, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that, that America, America has to learn that it's part of the world. And one of the things that keeps us from doing that uh, as fully as we should is the peculiarity of our institutions. We don't know other what we don't know anything about other people's institutions. But it's interesting you talk about Americans must realize that we are part of the world. Uh, we were talking before the program about your your father's involvement before the Second World War in uh, the Save America First uh, groupies, mm -hmm. and I was thinking then at the same time about. Uh, 
certainly the early part of the present Bush administration, and maybe even it continues, was predicated to a very large extent upon the notion of our separateness and let's just cut ourselves off in certain ways from the rest of the world. You think that's a lesson that uh, September 11th taught us, that that's impossible? Well, it certainly seemed that way at first. Uh, it, that seemed, it seemed to have profoundly uh, shaken the idea of uh, American exceptionalism. We certainly learned that we were not protected by the oceans, that we're vulnerable just like the rest of the world. And it seemed as if we were about to uh, abandon the sort of go-it-alone unilateralism that had marked the Bush administration's foreign policy and to some extent the foreign policy of, of all American administrations. Um, it seems to be, that seems to be slipping back now. And uh, evidently it's a lesson that every generation, every American generation has to learn for itself and learns the hard way and learns incompletely and forgets quickly. Well, you'd say forgets quickly. It's only been six months. Indeed. How could we be forgetting so soon? What are the forces? What, what well, drives we, us our, to our, our immense power, our immense military power, uh, en enabled us to accomplish in Afghanistan something that f that that uh, was really unexpected. I think by even by the administration itself, certainly by any potential critics, most potential critics of the administration, and certainly by most of the Europeans. Uh, the, the rapidity with which the goal of removing the Taliban regime was, was accomplished um, was good news, I think, but it, it, it may have strengthened uh, some retrograde. It evidently has strengthened some retrograde tendencies in the administration, which reflect retrograde tendencies in a large part of, uh, of the nation. Um, we may have been misled by our success. Uh, were we misinformed about our success or misled? I don't think we were really misinformed in the sense that, uh, the, that we've been seriously misinformed about what actually happened in Afghanistan. The meaning of, of that victory, if you want to call it that, uh, the interpretation, uh, we, we may have been, we have been misinformed perhaps in my judgment. This is not a, f a factual question, it's a question of interpretation. But I think we have been misinformed about the import of that, uh, of that victory. It, it doesn't mean that what happened in Afghanistan doesn't mean that um, a purely military approach to the problem of terrorism is, is tenable in the medium, even in the medium term, uh, and uh, uh, and I, I, part of the duty of people like me and people like you, is to I think is to uh, is to keep that discussion going, to to remind, to remind, to remind that uh, that uh, that there are other ways of approaching these problems, and that those ways are as important as the military way perhaps more important, in the, certainly in the, in the longer term, they're certainly more important. I guess the question I was raising um, was whether in your estimation the military uh, victory, the military successes mm -hmm. were as extensive as the media seemed to uh, paint them. Certainly one would expect the administration to, but... Mm -hmm. uh, well, given the terms, given, given, given the terms through which the military action was understood, yes, I think they were as extensive as the administration portrayed them. But there was an implication, there was an almost unstated implication behind the way the administration presented the situation and the way the press followed them in presenting it and the media that victory was a kind was the end of the story that 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 what we have to worry about in Afghanistan ended with the fall of the Taliban and we're now seeing that that's very far from the case uh, Afghanistan has will continue to be trouble 
Uh, it's trouble now. It'll be trouble in the future. And it's a commonplace, I guess, the idea that Americans want a, a tidy end to things. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, we're not going to get that. Well, it is that tidiness that it seems to me is the problem here uh, and the definitions. Going back to my favorite whipping boy, your uh, way you sit, the media. Uh, is there anything in your estimation that Americans should be thinking and perhaps doing uh, about media? Or do you take the position for the second about doing? One doesn't do, one can't do, one is prohibited from doing anything about the media. You mean anything, anything that what needs through to be done. political institutions, some way of affecting the, the way the media operates through what, public action, through democratic government? What do the media need to do to make us a... Um, I, it's funny, I can't think of the right word. Happier? No, I don't mean happier. Uh, preserve the democracy and the individualistic values that you spoke about at the beginning of this program. I, I don't know because I, I don't know, uh, I don't, the, the, media, the media is so, even, even as it is more centralized with a few large corporations dominating the ownership, anyway, of, of the media. It's also incredibly decentralized and, and, and uh, mercurial and hard to get a fix on. Uh, it develops in odd ways. Um, I just don't know. I mean, I, I cultivate my garden. You know, I try to make sure that I don't make, make the problem substantially worse through what I do. Uh, and I suppose I could recommend to all my brothers and sisters in the media that they do the same, you know, that they just try to first do no harm. Uh, perhaps a Hippocratic oath for journalists would, would, uh, would be a place to start. Not a hypocritical, but a Hippocratic. <laughs> yeah, we already take a Hippocritical oath, right. oath yeah. Uh, the question is, I guess, again, power. Do you feel, as I do, that there is so much power residing in the, uh, in the media? in the press, how do we know what, what happens except as we hear, listen, mm -hmm. read about it? We are, I don't say this even in a negative way, the plaything of the press, but where do, we get, uh, where do we get the ideas that make up who we are and what we are except from you fellows in yeah. the press? And it's so hard to, it's so hard to e e even discuss this without sounding Naive, hopelessly earnest, uh, to talk about the importance of standards and that 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 uh, there are professional responsibilities here, and that we have a, a responsibility to the public good and to an enlightened public. This Sounds is a good kind to of, me. It, 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 but one feels a little foolish uh, saying it. Uh, it it uh, doesn't cut a lot of ice in the in the dog eat dog world of of the market, where the answer to it is, well, if people want that, they'll demand it, and it'll be supplied. Um, and there's not a thing you can do about it. That's, um, uh, and that's a hard, that's, it's hard to answer, because it's so hard to conceive of ways of forcing it to happen. Uh, so one falls back on, on exhortation, and on, on education, and on, and, uh, and on um, the bully pulpit, uh, or the not so bully pulpit, and I don't really know of more to do than that. Talking about bully pulpits, when you were writing speeches for um, Jimmy Carter as president, I had to wear this sweater today just because <laughs> it was so damn cold uh, in this studio. It's, but it's a nice homage. But yeah. uh, is it a tribute to something you wrote? <laughs> Uh, actually, I can't take it's false. I can't take credit for the uh, for the sweater that uh, Jimmy Carter famously wore when he gave his first uh, energy address. Uh, that was uh, that was my friend Barry Jagoda, uh, who calculated quite rightly that the sweater was worth a thousand words. Yes, but <laughs> what those words were? Well, we no one remembers, but we certainly remember the sweater. Uh, 
You've talked about character. It's so important in the, um, in the democratic process. You relate that to Carter. You felt strongly about uh, the man, I gather, and his character. What does that mean? Well, uh, it's something that's... that's, uh, that's I, I should say, in the two minutes we have remaining. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, char character is a word that the meaning of which has has been beaten up and and knocked about the head uh, in the political arena, especially in the last few years. Uh, it got narrowed to mean um, sexual behavior. Uh, it is not that is not what it should mean in a in a public person. Uh, character is half the is half of what a great leader needs, but a great leader also needs a, needs a, a concept, a, an ideology, if you will, a set of public uh, values. It's not enough to be a good person. Uh, sometimes being a good person doesn't get you anywhere, um, but character, character counts, but the, what, it's when you come to define character that, the, that it really gets interesting and contentious. Character attached to a good idea, you mean? Good that's, character attached to good ideas? That's ideal. Right? That's ideal. And then with a little force of personality behind it. And then you're, then you're cooking with gas. Okay, one last question. We have 30 seconds. Who's the po who are the potential presidential candidates on the scene now who well, combine <clears throat> them? Well, right now, looking at the, the Democratic side, which is the only one where there's going to be a, uh, there's going to be a dispute, uh, well, you know, there's Gore still, there's Daschle, uh, and there's John Edwards, and then there's, uh, then there's a set of mystery characters that we don't even know about yet. I mean, I was thinking the other day, uh, well, Bob Reich is running for governor of Massachusetts. Now, uh, he might not even get the nomination, he might not get elected, but there are half a dozen Bob Reiches around the country that two years from now may be national figures. They may be the, just the fresh face that the Democratic Party is looking for. It's well, wide we'll, open. We'll get you back here to expand the prophecy. Thank you so much for joining me today, Rick Hurt. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to the Open Mind P.O. Box 7977 FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. Thank you.